Welcome everybody. I'm Alice Madden. I'm the executive director of the Getches Wilkinson Center for Natural Resources, Energy and Environment at Colorado Law. We are really excited about today's event, which is our second webinar in our series called The Climate Justice Lens is Here to Stay. Today we're presenting Farther and Faster, the Integral Role of Technology in an Equitable Clean Energy Economy, featuring two of the more innovative and action-oriented people I know, Phil Weiser and Jigger Shaw. Uh, but please mark your calendars for May 13th. We're really excited to announce we'll be hosting Secretary of Interior Deb Holland and Colorado Joe Neguse, Congressman Joe Neguse. So watch for more information on that. And at CU, we like to begin our events with an acknowledgement that our campus sits on the traditional territories and ancestral lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute Nations. And we pay our respects to those original stewards and to the many indigenous peoples who still have connections to these lands. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today. And first is my colleague and good friend, Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser. Before running for office, Phil was the Hatfield Professor of Law and Dean of Colorado Law, where he founded the Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology and Entrepreneurship. He served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice and as a Senior Advisor for T Technology and Innovation in the President Obama's National Economic Council. He previously served in President Clinton's Department of Justice in the Antitrust Division. He also clerked for both Justices Byron White and Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the Supreme Court. And Jigger Shaw. Prior to joining DOE, Jigger was, the most, was most recently co-founder and president of Generate Capital, where he focused on helping, helping entrepreneurs accelerate decarbonization solutions through the use of low-cost infra, infrastructure as a service financing. Prior to Generate, Shaw founded Sun Edison, a company that pioneered pay-as-you-save solar financing. And following Sun Edison, he served as the founding CEO of the Carbon War Room, a global nonprofit founded by Sir Richard Branson and Virgin Unite to help entrepreneurs address climate change. As you might imagine, these really brief introductions just scratch the surface of the breadth and depth of these folks' respective accomplishments. Um, I'll be moderating Q&A, so uh, I'll come back later and, and rejoin, uh, but I just wanted to let you know you can add your questions, look at the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So I'm really looking forward to this, and Phil, take it away. I'm gonna start on a glimpse. For me, back 10 years ago, when I traveled on Air Force Two with then Vice President Joe Biden and the head of RPE, um, who uh, I was going to uh, join NREL discussing the importance of energy innovation. Part of what that conversation was about, and this was again leveraging work I had done here at CU and Silicon Flatirons and anticipating work we we're going to do in a co-venture of Silicon Flatirons and Getches Wilkinson around energy innovation is think about these challenges of how we catalyze innovation to meet what are the real hard issues related to climate change. Um, I wanna start on a element that doesn't get talked about as much that's on my mind and, and um, Jigar can talk about probably some more of the uh, bread and butter and then we can have a conversation. I want, I want to talk about resilience as a policy goal and as a, as a requirement that we think about with an innovation lens and mindset. Resilience means you can adapt and withstand change. Part of what we need in our discussion is not just how do we address and mitigate climate change, but how do we adapt to that reality of a changing climate. In Colorado, we saw more wildfires and droughts in recent times than we've ever have seen before. That's not gonna go back. Resilience means the ability during a drought to have water that's adaptable and manageable. And that means we have to build systems to enable us to adapt and manage to changing water opportunities. Wildfires means we have to be able to build systems to respond to, to adapt to, and to manage the threat and reality of wildfires. That resilience demand calls on us to think with an innovation mindset, what 
practices, what technologies can help us be more resilient. I wanna layer on this another point because we're talking today about climate. It's also the case that this pandemic has called on us to think about resilience, what technologies, what practices help us be more resilient. Telemedicine has gotten a big boost during this time, for example, that it didn't get during a long time when it was theoretically possible, but people weren't putting as much effort to making it work. So I know we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about a range of technologies which will address the issues around carbon. I wanted to make sure I focused on, as we thought about this imperative of technological change and climate, the adaptation challenge too, and the need to think about resilience. So let me stop there. I know we've got lots of good opportunity for back and forth and let uh, Jagar take it away. You're very kind. Um, I, I completely agree with you on, on, on what you were suggesting there. I think the, the, my remarks, I would say, are more around um, how we go from uh, research to commercialization. Um, I think part of what I have found within the Department of Energy, but also I think with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and other labs is that the United States is second to none around uh, finding better ways, cheaper ways, more innovative ways of getting things done. And that is absolutely the case around decarbonization. I'd say the vast majority of the technologies that we need to um, to really decarbonize our economy uh, and to meet the goals that President Biden has set forth around uh, decarbonization of our electricity grid by 2035 and the whole economy by 2050 are already uh, invented. And in fact, are in, uh, have been invented 10 plus years ago. Um, but our ability as a nation to take those inventions and bring them to scale has largely been lacking, mostly because I think our narrative is all wrong. So for instance, we have established a narrative, frankly, since the Clinton administration, so I don't think it's uh, any one political party, that, um, that more R&D will reduce costs. And in fact, that has been thoroughly debunked, that more R&D just produces more innovation, uh, that cost reduction comes simply through deployment. So when you look at solar and wind and lithium ion batteries, where we've had the most success in the last 10 years, um, it wasn't R&D that reduced the costs of solar, wind, and lithium ion batteries. It was deployment, which then pulled R&D that was already on the shelf, which we should always be doing more, so there's more stuff on the shelf, um, into manufacturing, which then allowed for rapid uh, reduction in cost, you know, something on the order of around 15% cost reduction for every cumulative doubling of our experience in terms of putting things um, through manufacturing facilities and into practice. Um, and, you know, when you have six cumulative doublings, you get substantial cost reduction. And we've seen that in those three areas. And now we need to instigate that into many other sectors, you know, geothermal, uh, high voltage DC lines, green hydrogen, uh, whether you think about um, um, long duration storage, right? There are many technologies where we've actually already invented the technology, but the first unit is gonna cost five times what it needs to cost to be deployed at scale. And we need to figure out how to get the confidence that this learning curve theory is actually not speculative but in fact is proven, as proven as Moore's law or proven as, as other types of concepts. And then that allows you to more confidently deploy public dollars to put the first projects to work. I mean, the state of Colorado is a great example. When it passed the renewable portfolio standard in 2004 by a ballot initiative, part of that was an innovation title with an Xcel Energy. And it paid 17 cents a kilowatt hour to deploy an eight megawatt solar project in Ken Salazar, its own dist old district in Alamosa, Colorado. And, uh, and then separately paid more money to put in um, concentrating solar PV and other innovation, innovative technologies. And it was those deployments that actually caused 
dramatic cost reduction in the solar space. And the total cost to ratepayers in Colorado was less than a 0.1% rate increase, right? But in exchange, Colorado got all that, those jobs. So all of the jobs in the renewable energy sector came because of the early leadership that Colorado showed um, in there. And I think that that level of public support needs to be done in you know, 25 additional sectors. That's the only way we're gonna get the cost reduction down as we go from millions to billions to trillions, uh, which is what we really need to get to, trillions of dollars of deployment to be able to meet the president's goals. And so with that, I look forward to a vibrant conversation. I could jump onto that last point. The idea that all of us can and should be thinking about, and for the students who are watching, I commend you give this thought. We have a massive coordination challenge. The transitions we're making in our electricity sector, in our transportation sector, have a range of often under anticipated uh, coordination challenges. So electric vehicles is a very easy and good example. How do we think about charging infrastructure that if you don't think about it in advance, um, we're gonna end up after the fact trying to re-engineer and fix problems because we haven't thought hard enough about it. I think in that area too, this resilience point I mentioned is one worth keeping in mind. Um, we are going through a, a transitional time. Uh, it's gonna require leadership in both the public and private sectors. That's great. I, um, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I do think that we have these you know, cultural um, things that we've, you know, sort of just come to understand. Um, and they are constructs that we ourselves put in place and not so long ago. So when you think about, um, you know, the dot-com bubble that, you know, many of us were a part of in the late nineties, you know, as the theory goes, you could get funded for a napkin and then, you know, you could go public and you could become, you know, Jeff Bezos and Amazon or Mark Cuban, you know, today, who's the, you know, the owner of the Mavericks. And what we found in reality was that, in fact, while the lack of government regulation, which was touted as the success of Silicon Valley was helpful. Um, in fact, today, you know, there's a lot of people who wish that we put on more government regulation at the time um, to figure out how we actually got things done. And, um, and, I think what ended up happening is that, that we ended up forgetting that this sort of libertarian view of letting the, um, letting the innovators innovate and the government should be hands off doesn't really work in our sector. It doesn't really work in this decarbonization sector. And so as Phil suggested, I think that the coordination um, between all these different arms of government, whether it's local, county, state, or federal, is just critical because there's just no way for us to put in EV charging infrastructure, for instance, without standards, right? Today, Tesla uses one standard and the rest of the industry uses a different standard. That's highly problematic. How many, how many people have gone past a Tesla charging station and wish that they had some sort of adapter by which they could charge their EV there, but they can't, right? But the same thing's true around, you know, how do we actually use public property to, uh, facilitate charging, right? For instance, um, there are a lot of Uber and Lyft drivers who uh, have to wait 45 minutes to an hour to pick up somebody at the airport. While they're sitting in the cell phone parking lot, they could be charging. But how do you get the permissions to actually put that in? And who should be responsible for paying for that infrastructure? And you know, how, does, how do we all benefit from it, given that many of these Uber and Lyft drivers are driving 40,000 miles a year and, and contributing to air pollution in the area as a result? Uh, and so, you know, there's some shared benefits, there's some local benefits, and then there's obviously benefits to the users that are using that infrastructure. And, you know, how do we share the cost across all of those different constituencies um, while recognizing that if we really want to bring good quality work and blue collar work uh, and good paying work back to our society, we are going to have to rebuild our infrastructure. So Jagar, there's so many good questions back and forth on this. Let me pull one strand out, which is an obvious one for you and I to visit about. 
the role of the federal government versus state governments. As you noted properly, and it's a point of pride in Colorado, we got out front seeing a opportunity to move towards a clean energy economy, had one of the earlier renewable portfolio standards. Our governor at the time, um, Bill Ritter, made this essential point of his work that helped make us more of a leader on jobs. We have NREL here. So that's positioned us well. The challenge that you've also noted is some of these issues, standards, think about smart grid, for example, you need to get at the federal level. So as you think about electricity, locally regulated at the state level, for example, versus uh, standards and breakthroughs national level, how do you integrate and think about the role of the federal government and the state governments? Well, you know, I think one thing to recognize is that state governments are going to have a better understanding of where the cultural relevance is. You know, one of the things that I find um, so heartening by the president and his vision is I think he understands that this is not an engineering problem, right? I think we all want to say, well, if we have the right science and we have the right models and we have the right supercomputers, we can just solve the problem. And I think what the president recognizes is if we want to go from $200 billion of climate change solution deployment per year to a trillion dollars a year, which is what we need to be able to meet this crisis, well, then that means you're going to have to have a broader constituency of support. And that includes environmental justice communities, and it includes labor uh, as well at the table. And traditionally, the environmental groups labor and environmental justice communities haven't really talked to each other about how to put this all together. And then you also have broader constituencies as Colorado has shown over and over again, whether it's within the oil and gas community or whether it's in other traditional energy communities, there's been a lot of stakeholder engagement. And so part of what the governors can do and the states can do is to make sure that we actually have the ability to uh, to get a lot of that adjudicated locally. So if the state says, look, we really want bioenergy to be one of the key ways that we make this happen because we have a strong lobby of, of folks in the bioenergy space, or we really wanna make sure that regenerative agriculture and farming is the central way that we meet our carbon reduction goals because we have a strong farm lobby, then you have the right to be able to say that unequivocally without some engineering group saying, well, we did this analysis and that's not where your lowest cost to comply with the carbon reduction is gonna come from. And I think we have to recognize that this is political, right? I mean, you know, if you're gonna basically rebuild our country, which is what it takes, right? To decarbonize our country, we have to rebuild all of the infrastructure in our country by 2050, right? That rebuilding requires political support. It requires a group of people to come together with varying points of view and to say, we agree with what it is that we're recommending here. And while it's slightly different than what the model suggests is the lowest cost approach, it is the, it is the, it is the approach that we can use to get the most stakeholders on board. And I think the federal government has to recognize that that process is valuable and that that process should be supported by whatever tax credits and incentives and rebates, and in my case, the loan programs office, low cost uh, senior debt financing, needs to support that vision, because otherwise we're not gonna be able to work at speed and scale. Well, Jigar, I really appreciate being on the stage virtually with a federal <laughs> official who believes in and empowers the role of states as laboratories of democracy who may need to take different approaches and experiment. Uh, Barry has a question that's a perfect one to pull in here, which is about infrastructure. There is a conversation going on about infrastructure, what it is, why it matters. I will say this conversation underscores broadband, which enables us to do things with less um, carbon emissions think about people working from home and what we've done last year. Water infrastructure, um, which is going to be more and more important in a time of climate change, and electricity transportation infrastructure all matter and all protect our society. And one of the problems with infrastructure is people take it for granted. They don't often invest in it 
and then you need it later and you haven't done the work to have it. Um, what thoughts do you have overall about the nature of this national conversation about infrastructure and how do we best build the understanding so that we're willing and able to make these critical investments? Well, I mean, you know, I don't know that I um, have a lot to contribute to what the president's already said on the broader definition of infrastructure. I would say that one of the things that we've learned in COVID times is that um, it is shocking how important, you know, the infrastructure of childcare is to our ability to work. And so, you know, whether it's, you know, like safely being able to send our kids back to school or whether it's, you know, our childcare apparatus and how we actually work within that, or whether it's around, you know, how we take care of our, you know, elderly or, or that kind of thing, you know, there's an entire conversation there. But separately, I think with broadband, I mean, with COVID and, and having everybody um, uh, learn uh, in a distance learning environment, we've also learned, you know, how our inequities have been exacerbated through COVID, right? So for all the people who we already had a broadband divide, and now when you think about all the people who need to uh, do Zoom calls for work at home and all of the, you know, stalling of your photograph or people can't hear you. I mean, just imagine all the children that are trying to learn via Zoom school and who can't get that done, right? And so there are specific answers to your question, right, around, um, you know, modern infrastructure, particularly electricity, where, you know, I think I have a big role to play. Um, really needs modern broadband. Like there is no way to actually build a modern grid without having the same level of demand dexterity, being able to fluctuate people's loads, right? Their thermostats, their water heaters, their refrigerators, their air conditioners with the same level of dexterity or their EV charging for that matter that we currently flex natural gas peaker plants. Well, you can't do that unless you've got broadband. And so, so I mean, in that case, they're directly linked, right? Um, but in other cases, I mean, I certainly understand that the, the, that the definition of, of infrastructure has become broader, but I, I do think that the, the public services that we all rely on to be able to live our modern lifestyles um, has become broader than just roads and bridges. Well, the broadband point, it's speaking my language. I will say we worked hard during the pandemic to get access to kids in Zoom school who didn't have broadband access connected because they weren't able to learn and we're gonna pay a price for that lack of broadband. That is a powerful point of resilience. Let me underscore for those who aren't as in the weeds, this point about broadband and electricity usage. The more we move to intermittent and uncertain sources of energy, think wind and solar, the more we need on the demand side, adaptive response. That whole equation is only enabled by having broadband so that people know when to charge their electric cars and when not to charge electric cars, when to run their dryers and not to run their dryers. Broadband can automate and enable those sorts of adaptive responses. Part of what we are suffering from in this recent Texas spike is we did not have a resilient energy system. Electricity pr prices were able to go really high because we weren't set up for a shock to that system. That was a lack of resilience. Um, Jagar, as you look at that problem and you think solutions, what technologies, what practices do we need to better enable resilience so that we can manage a world where we're going to see, you know, flux, fluctuating uh, supply and demand on the energy side, we've got to be able to better handle it without having the sort of rate shock that um, came from that episode. Yeah, it's a great question. And one that um, um, I have a, uh, maybe let me start with a minor correction, maybe of, of the setup of your question, which is that um, so we have been able to predict between 15 minutes and an hour beforehand, exactly how much solar and wind we're gonna produce. For every 15 and, and minute and one hour, 
uh, period of the day. And Excel actually does a fabulous job of that. So as well as ERCOT in Texas. And so, so it's not that this is intermittent or uncertain. It's actually, it is, it is a variable renewable energy source and it is fairly certain actually how much gets produced. Um, and so within actually quite tight tolerances and we've invested heavily through the, through the national labs and other places um, to be able to do that work. So now the question becomes, now that we have that information, what do we do with it? And there's lots of things we could do with it. So for instance, we've upgraded many people, including in Colorado, to advanced meters, right? Smart meters. Um, and one of the things that did in Texas, which was very disappointing, was they didn't use the smart meters to actually manage uh, the brownouts that were required. So for instance, um, when you have advanced distributed energy resources and DERs as they're called, which the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is now requiring all utilities and all independent system operators to be able to bring that data in and give it full access within the next 270 days. So all of the public service commissions are trying to do that. Um, the first line of defense is that you can actually manage people's loads to save the grid. So instead of blacking them out, you could have forced everyone's thermostats to go to 55 degrees, for instance, in Texas so that people weren't actually trying to heat their homes to 75 degrees, um, you know, in direct contravention to what the governor was suggesting people do. Um, and that would have saved the grid, right? But second of all, um, the meters themselves are able to be shut off remotely. So instead of what they did, which was a very traditional blackout of entire distribution lines, which happened to be where a lot of poor people lived, they could have actually shut off people's meters. They could have just said, we are shutting off you guys first, 10% of people for three hours. Then we're gonna cut off you guys for 10%, three hours, and then you guys for three hours. That way, most people actually had power 21 hours of the day. But instead, they shut off certain people for three days. And that sinks. And we have the technology to integrate with the variable renewable energy data um, which the variability also came from the natural gas plants that were frozen. And uh, so lots of variability. Um, we have the ability to integrate both the demand and the supply. So that technology, again, is off the shelf. It's there. It hasn't been fully deployed. And Xcel Energy and many of the utilities down in um, Texas still haven't paid the $40 million for the software to actually utilize that flexibility. But, you know, hopefully that'll happen now. But in general... The technology is there. And then the flip side of it is also there. So once you determine that it is 90% cheaper to depend on demand flexibility over supply flexibility, which it is, well, now on a day to day basis, you can pay for that flexibility. So instead of spinning up a natural gas peaker plant, you can actually pay someone to opt in to allow their water heater to be you know, heated up at noon instead of at 9 a.m. after you're done taking a shower. What states and, are doing that? What states are doing that well right now? Any come to mind? The only state that's doing that well now is the New York ISO. California has been woefully behind in doing it. And many other states as well. And there are a lot of pilot programs with, you know, um, our good friend Brian Hannigan over at Holy Cross and and uh, you know uh, utility in Colorado and others. But in general, the only large area that's doing it well is the New York Independent System Operator. Um, but you could pay people. So now people could opt in and say, wow, I got paid $8 this month because they used my water heater to provide this level of flexibility, which they otherwise would have paid $80 to a natural gas peaker plant for the same services, right? And so you're in a situation where you can, the only way that we can actually reduce electricity rates, the only way to reduce electricity rates, not reduce the growth of electricity rates, but actually physically reduce them is by empowering consumers, mostly low moderate income consumers, to actually have more flexible appliances that are connected into these systems, right? And so, like you said, Phil, like not only are you providing greater resiliency to the homeowners by having these smart appliances and you know battery storage and other things that you could do. I mean, some people were able to power their entire house off their Tesla, right? Or their F-150 truck. And so you could do that, or you could just like make the grid more resilient and your neighborhood more resilient by being able to have these features. And so I totally agree with you that, but I wanna make sure people understand that it's not an either or, 
you actually reduce rates by putting in this resiliency infrastructure and it's there for emergencies as you have uh, you know, larger swings with weather events. So Bob Hallman asked a question that relates to this. As you think about the life cycle of innovation, it's important to know at one end, you have basic R&D developing beta through technologies. Then you have a beta version, you try to pilot, then you try to get more adoption. Here on this, I'll call it demand side management, we've got an adoption challenge, which is the technology is there. It just hasn't yet been implemented on the broader scale um, with New York being sort of a leading state. Uh, Bob's question is, how do you think about both uh, maybe financing and technological development when you're in the sort of earlier stage where you're trying to even do, call it pre-development and basic work that starts to build up a new technology. Um, take, for example, storage as, as a possible example. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think it goes to the fundamental misunderstanding that we all have today about how technology becomes commercialized. So I think there is a notion, and in the, in the laboratory environment, as well as Department of Energy, there's a system called TRL, and I don't even know what it stands for, but it basically is the maturity of a technology. So TRL1 is, you know, concept on the blackboard, and then TRL6 is, you know, a lab, uh, a lab scale validation of the technology, right? And then TRL7 and 8 are missing. Right, and that's what he's talking about, which is this pre-deployment uh, demonstration step, I would say. And then TRL9 is where we step in, which is full commercialization, which we also have a problem with, and that's what we've been discussing. But I think his question is more around this demonstration step. And this is where I basically fundamentally disagree with the way in which we think about RD&D, &D, right? Research and development and demonstration, which is that, there is a notion that the private sector or loan programs office for that matter will provide this capital and nothing can be farther from the truth, right? When you're in demonstration, those are grants. They are always grants and they will always be grants. But what happens is, is that we make trade-offs with our dollars. So we double down and ARPA E is a great example of this, where we double down on innovation as opposed to providing critical demonstration dollars. And ARPA E has recently added the scale up feature, which I think solves some of this problem. But it is a fundamental hole in our innovation cycle. And those are grant dollars. The other thing I would say is when we do provide the grants, we generally don't collect the data necessary to move to full commercialization. So we provide the grants, but the people we provide grants to are generally such small companies that we don't actually hold them to account to actually make sure that the data is provided to us in a format that we can share with utility companies, the S&P and Moody's credit rate rating agencies or other people such that you can actually bridge to, to the full commercialization side. So you end up with thousands upon thousands of technologies that are at this TRL six stage that are sitting at the national labs with no hope of ever being commercialized. So as you think about promising technologies that are further along ready for broader deployment, but aren't being used. Did I catch right? You thought this demand management off of smart grid technology rates really high in your list? Oh, it's already being fully deployed. I don't know whether the electric utilities and the independent system operators will fully embrace them, but the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has already mandated that they do so. I mean, that hasn't worked in the past, but we'll try this time. And, uh, and you know, almost all major appliances you can purchase today have this feature from water heaters to refrigerators to air conditioning systems to you know others and so air source heat pumps you know etc so and even all of your uh, electric vehicle apps right your ev charger if you were to put a level 1 or level 2 charger in your garage um, all of those now have this feature built in so you can adjust it so you can set it up to say well when i move to time of use rates I'm going to plug in my car when it's convenient because I'm not going to remember later to plug it in. Yeah. But don't let electrons flow until Exxon Energy is offering me cheap rates. And so, so like that feature and all those features are already in almost all brand new models of appliances that are being sold in Best Buy and Home Depot and Lowe's and that kind of stuff. But they're not actually 
then being fed into the grid operation software of the utility. And so the utility continues to ask for $20 billion a year to upgrade distribution systems to make sure that if everyone turns everything on at the same time, you can still you know, like, you know, be okay. Instead, if they invested in, in introducing this into the, the grid operation software, it would be 90% cheaper than that 20 billion. For less than 2 billion, you could actually keep the distribution um, feeders going. And remember, most of the money being spent on this, these appliances are being spent by consumers. So it's not even ratepayer money that has to be spent to do this. You just have to turn on this feature so and integrate it into your software. So that's sort of already there, ready to be used for frustrating reasons, not yet. Uh, so Pam asked the question, where are we on carbon capture and storage as a technology to address uh, concerns about uh, greenhouse gas emissions? And how can this path become more promising with different potential tools? Um, uh, she mentioned uh, incentives or otherwise. Yeah, so, so this is a great example of something that's different than what we just suggested. I would say that in 2008, um, the quality of the technologies that we had available to us uh, were just not sufficient. And, you know, through all of the political wranglings around clean coal and this and that and whatever it is, we spent lots of money on figuring this out. And today, about 13 years later, we now have a number of technologies that have hit this TRL6 uh, stage, which now allows you to start doing demonstrations. And so in the 2020 Energy Act um, that was passed in December of 2020, uh, we funded a whole bunch of, the US Congress gave us money to fund a whole bunch of demonstration projects. Uh, with these technologies. And those demonstration projects are moving forward. And, you know, there's a, 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 a funding opportunities notice and, you know, and, and, and people will be selected and that money will flow by the end of the year. Um, but I would say that the technology through the 45Q program where they're providing uh, money from the federal government at $50 a ton for CO2 that gets sequestered and captured um, to the, the groundbreaking work on the enhanced oil recovery work, et cetera. Um, we are now in a position that we are gonna be demonstrating these projects with at least 20 or 30 major projects that I know of that'll start construction over the next three years. Um, and that I think will then lead to uh, learning and then greater confidence in what the next generation design will be. And then we'll start that you know, flywheel of um, you know, learning that makes things better. And then I think we're gonna to get to a cost-effective point because I think we all realize that pick a percentage, you know, 20, 30% of these carbon emissions are going to be stubbornly difficult to uh, offset just with technology, particularly like in the green cement space, the steel manufacturing space and other industrial spaces. And so having this technology will be critical uh, to being able to meet the 2050 goals that the president has laid down. You got people really interested in the conversation we had about demand management. Um, two questions. One is, uh, how and whether are we engaging social scientists to help us make this system work? Um, or to ask the question from a different angle, what are the barriers? Why, why aren't we seeing this infrastructure that's already there to do such a powerfully beneficial um, impact um, how do we enable that to get moving? Would social scientists help? Um, and then the other question um, that uh, KK uh, asked on this point is, um, is, is there a label or name for this technology? Um, sh she's wondering what do you want to call it, like demand flexibility? I, I call it demand side management, but, but what do we call it and how do we get it, I guess, are the two questions. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not the person in charge of branding it, so I don't know the answer to that last question. But it is called, uh, I think at DOE, we have this thing called grid connected buildings. Um, you know, you definitely have D derms and DERS. So that's distributed energy res resources and then distributed energy resource management, right? Um, so there's lots of names. 
I think on the first question, it really it's about you know regulation and legislation at the state level. Um, um, there's a company called O Power that was started by social scientists, and they solved all these problems. I mean, ten years ago. So that we've got company, one here called Uplight, um, which Uplight is the merger of a couple of companies. Thing. Yeah, they're, they're a real star, Colorado um, unicorn working in this space. Um, the challenge is if the underlying regular utilities aren't committed to this. And right. just to, to put a fine point on this, Jagar, utilities have been historically paid a rate of return based on how much they sell. So part of the challenge here is from a regulated utility incentive structure, trying to sell less through demand management is not in the utilities economic interest under the current model. So we solved that problem in almost all um, in almost all states about five or eight years ago, whether it was um, decoupling, there was lots of legislation that we passed and regulations that would solve that problem. The bigger problem here is cultural. The grid operators still like to use the telephone. They don't like to use the internet. And so when they turn on and off power plants, they like to call people up and say, turn it down, turn it up, let's do this. There's no way to phone call 10,000 customers. And so, they don't really like using the internet. By the way, another extraordinary company in Colorado called Spray invented all of this software for grid operators out of Colorado Springs, or no, Fort Collins, sorry. And so, um, you know, and that software is in wide utilization in Brazil, Japan, the UK, other places, everywhere but the United States of America. So, um, so like all of this stuff is generally there. And on the social scientist point, just to finish that point, um, O Power is now owned by. Um, you know, Larry Ellison's company, Oracle, right? And so like he bought it because he thought that the utilities were ready to deploy it at scale. And then he's found that that's not true. So in general, I would just say that this is where governors and, you know, and state public service commissioners have to lead. At some point, you can only ask utility companies to do the right thing on, the, on behalf of ratepayers for long enough, and then you have to just force them to do it. Uh Jamie Roth says, uh, this sounds like it's a home energy management system. And ideally we all have smartphone apps that could enable them to work effectively. Um, and then ask the question, where is this being done back to New York so that regular people can benefit? Um, I wanna go back to a point because Pam made it, it's worth clarifying. How do we address the risk? Let's just say we do have carbon captured storage. It works really well from a carbon perspective. Her worry is that might keep existing um, either uh, let's just say gas, uh, natural gas plants going, um, but we might be less um, vigilant than we should be about conventional pollutants as well, because carbon capture and storage does not address concerns about other non-carbon based emissions. Is that right? Sorry, this is a question about carbon sequestration and storage. Yeah, it's basically as if you use that technology, we need to be clear that you also have to be vigilant about other conventional pollutants that could still be produced from such plants. Yeah, no, well, I mean, I think that that goes without saying, but I guess what I would say is that, you know, this is not a Plato's philosopher king approach, right? This is why you have the Environmental Protection Agency. This is why you have state government regulators and all the other things that you have, which is to, make sure that one policy doesn't lead to unforeseen consequences on another policy. Certainly the way that we justify a lot of these investments and the speed at which we mandate them is through public health benefits. I mean, that is the largest source of benefits, right? I mean, for instance, uh, on, on transit buses, um, when you think about, you know, the cost per mile of a transit bus versus a diesel bus. A transit bus today is about a penny a mile cheaper than uh, a diesel bus. And you see that with, you know, the 16th Street Mall and, you know, the work that Denver uh, has done. But the real savings are $40,000 a year per bus in asthma reduction, right? But, you know, the problem is, is that this cross subsidization between the electric utility system and the healthcare system is very difficult to do. The state of Colorado doesn't pay for all of its healthcare costs. A lot of it's paid for by private insurance companies, by Medicare and Medicaid, 
And then you've got the state having to put its fair share into it as well. And so the state's portion of that $40,000 might be $4,000. And the federal government's portion of it's $36,000. And so then the question becomes like, well, do you mandate moving all buses in the state of Colorado on behalf of human health over to these other things? I mean, school buses, EPA had a finding that the air quality inside of a bus is four times worse than the air quality outside of a bus for all school children back in 2008, right? And mandated that all school buses have to be converted. There was a, there's a, a, a person from the state of Colorado, I forgot his name now, but he owned like three auto dealerships who picked up on this and was like, hey, Jigger, we should be converting school buses to electric. And he was thwarted at every turn. People were like, oh, that's too much money. Too much money to save the, the health impacts on school children? Well, I don't know. We don't know where that money is going to come from. So Colorado and others still haven't done it. Right now, the president has said, we're going to do it. And it's going to be in the American Jobs Plan. And we're going to convert 25% of school buses to electric. And we're going to do it on this way and this schedule. But you know, a lot of this stuff, look, I'm not a big fan of regulation. I'm, you know, I'm somebody who was in the private sector for a long time. Regulation costs money. I totally get it. But at the end of the day, there are some things that save money, particularly on the healthcare side. And you're not going to just get it done through the private sector because the private sector doesn't pay most of those healthcare costs. And so they're not in their equations. And so in general, I think that either you have to price those externalities or you have to figure out how to like, um, use government regulations. But I think the notion that we're just going to use logic to get to that finish line is very difficult to see. Yeah, Jigger, Bob Hallman picks a, a point up here, which is back in the resilience theme, another word that economists use is externalities. The private sector doesn't bear these externalities, a lack of resilience being an example. So how does the government handle this market failure? I want to put a fine point on a topic we haven't mentioned yet, but it's important here cybersecurity. Part of the, I think, risk and concerns about the home energy management systems that are enabled by internet uh, supported applications is the concern about cybersecurity. What are your thoughts on the state of cybersecurity in the electricity sector and what do we do about it? Well, I mean, it certainly was terrible, right, under John Wellinghoff's leadership at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I think he spent a lot of time on cybersecurity. This was 2009 to maybe 2013. Um, I think since that time, there's been a tremendous amount of effort made on cybersecurity. It started under the second term of the Obama administration, but I think all the way through the Trump administration, I think took it quite seriously as well. And today, I would say every electric utility company I know of is focused on cybersecurity. And even the Energy Star program and other programs within the Department of Energy have set clear standards around cybersecurity that are being implemented now across uh, all of these applications. And so... Um, I certainly can't say that cybersecurity is solved. It feels like a uh, escalating arms race where you have a solution and then someone breaks it and you got to find a new one and that's going to keep happening. But, um, but I do think that on the cybersecurity front, we are um, in a place now where we feel like we've got a pathway to, to making that successful. I would underscore for people this federal role of developing standards um, in this space. So we talked Energy Star about its standards, uh, smart grid standards, cybersecurity standards. Um, it's a critical area. And part of the challenge I think we've touched on is how we think about the role of the public sector in enabling um, innovation. Um, standard setting is a, is a critical area. I see we have Alice back to help bring us home. So maybe I should turn it back over to her. Yeah, I, I, I'm certainly not needed um, to moderate this conversation, but um, I, I know we have a hard stop right on the top of the hour. So I, I, there's so many interesting things I'd love to follow up on, but I was thinking about the role of government and people are certainly familiar with policy, but maybe not so much as how it can help scale technology. Earlier, you brought up the Colorado uh, portfolio standard 2004, which are really fought and worked with them. And then they helped us double it and triple it but we also added a percentage requirement for distributed generation. So instead of just yeah. utility scale, it, it, it helped local economies and created jobs. And you mentioned green cement. I am just fascinated with this. The thought of that all of our airport runways and, and highways could be sequestering carbon, I think is amazing. Um, 
The only law I know of, and I haven't done any recent research, is San Francisco is requiring of their construction vendors that if you want to build something for us, whether it's a you know airport or building, your cement has to sequester X amount of carbon. So that's an example of how a policy can drive scale of a technology, which I think is really an appropriate role of government. Um, you know, you hit it the nail on the head. We always say R and D, but everyone forgets about the development part. Like, we don't just invest in research; we have to invest in the development. And I don't remember these numbers offhand, and, and I don't know if you've memorized them yet at, at the LPO. But um, it's my recollection: for every dollar that you invested in these proven technologies, multiples of monies came back in terms of um, further private investment and job creation. So this is something that is for the greater public interest. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's difficult to use that argument on a sector by sector basis, but on a broad basis for every dollar we put in, we get, you know, 20 plus dollars back uh, to the US economy. So, um, so that from that perspective, you know, every dollar we put in is worth it. Um, I think the, 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 the broader challenge is I just think that the way in which everyone takes responsibility for bringing about the president's vision around 2035, you know, decarbonization of electricity and 2050 of the economy is something that I think is lacking, right? Like, I think that there's a sense that the federal government is going to pass some sort of big law and it's all going to, you know, start flowing downhill and everyone's got their job to do and it's all going to get done. And that's just not true at all, as we discussed earlier, right? The federal government will pass whatever it passes. If it's $2 trillion in the American Jobs Plan, great. If it's $1 trillion, fine. Whatever it passes, it passes. But when you think about some of the basic blocking and tackling that has to be done, it's really something that requires leadership at a local level. So for instance, most of our streetlights in the United States still are not LED because the utilities own them and the utilities get paid a fixed price per fixture. And they're like, why would we turn them into LEDs? Like we get paid the same amount of money either way. So like, even though it would use less electricity, like we're not gonna lift a finger on that. And that's frustrating, right? I mean, it saves itself money. Why wouldn't you do that, right? Separately, we've already paid to wire up all the streetlights in the country. They're already wired up. We already destroyed the sidewalks, destroyed the road, get the, we got the power there, we stuck it back in, repaired the road, repaired the sidewalk. It's there. So why wouldn't you hang an electric vehicle charger off of that light pole? Guess who does it? All of the UK and Germany. Guess who doesn't do it? The United States of America. And so part of this is actually saying there's no law that's gonna be passed by the state, by the federal government that mandates all this stuff. What they're going to provide is rebates and subsidies and tax credits and this and that, and maybe even a you know clean energy standard, right? But the states and the localities have to say, gosh darn it, we're going to do this. I mean, it, it employs people. It provides good union jobs. It does all of these things. Why are we not going to force people to do the things that they're too lazy to do on their own, right? And we are constantly breaking things. Things go bad all the time right? People's air conditioners go bad. And then what happens? They need one that day because it's 100 degrees outside. And the, the guy who pulls up has an air conditioner in the back. It's a CR 13, not a CR 16 air conditioner. And they provide on-the-spot financing at 30% interest. And a lot of folks are like, well, I don't have $5,000 sitting in my bank account. And they make a bad decision right on the spot. We have the ability to intervene at that place. But you don't want the federal government intervening in that place. Right? You want the states, the utilities, the localities to intervene at that space. And so my feeling is that there needs to be greater uh, responsibility taken by all levels of government from university presidents all the way through. And all of us need to be held accountable to the parts that we bring to the table. And then we all work together to make this the largest wealth creation opportunity of our lifetimes. Uh, a great question came in that I wanted to ask as well is about the training and retraining opportunities. Yeah. Again, it's often a kind of a throwaway line, but there's there's real opportunities as we transition um, our energy economies because we don't want to leave behind people who have you know they brought us electricity and heat for decades and decades, and we no, can't. We have a, no, look, we're gonna we're gonna we we project we need 25 million new jobs to be able to get this done. 
So no one's gonna be left behind. We need everybody. I think the bigger question is how do we map the jobs properly and use the money that the Department of Labor has already allocated for this, which most people are not applying for, to get this done, right? And a lot of that's, you know, working with unions, which who are very good at using a lot of this for retraining dollars and, you know, have not necessarily been invited to all these sectors. But the other piece is mapping these jobs properly, right? A lot of folks in the fracking industry don't want to do, you know, solar installation. Got it. But guess what they can do is, you know, ground source heat pumps, right? Or geothermal energy, which by the way, is just fracking, right? So like there's lots of areas where their jobs can be mapped into something we actually need that needs the exact skill set, as opposed to saying everyone's going to be a wind technician or a solar technician. They could also cap abandoned wells, which is a huge sure. problem and, you know, obviously a public safety issue. Um, sure. There's a lot of that. But I think that I, I don't think we should be saying to people, hey, there's a job over here. Like, why don't you just go do it? You're lazy because you're not doing it. We need to like be you know, more empathetic about it and say, look, this is a trade that people have actually learned over the last 20, 30 years. It's not an easy thing for them to transition into a different trade. And there needs to be a lot a very thoughtful process on that transition. Yeah, I could not agree more. And you know, you you both hit it on the head earlier. It's like we know what to do. We have the technology. It's often the political will, but it's also the narrative. We've gotten this amazing odd division that we have to deal with. And the role of social science is, I think, is going to be really important. You yeah. know, how do we reach all the American people about how amazing these opportunities are, how severe the risks are, but really the opportunities are just astounding. I couldn't agree more. There's a lot, lot of work on that, and I think that was a good discussion for people. Um, part of the point I would just make is change management is, is hard for people. Um, and I, I agree with uh, what Jigger said about workers, it's hard. For consumers, it's hard. For utilities, it's hard. Um, we've got to articulate the moral imperative, the policy goals, and then be creative about how to make these changes happen. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You really a pleasure being with you, Alice. Thank you. I'll stay on for a moment if, for, with some more information, but thank you both so much. This was absolutely fabulous. My pleasure. Discussion. Good yeah. luck. Thank, thank you, guys. guys. Take care now. Bye-bye.